Let's talk about shock and how to control bleeding. So what is shock? And most people get this confused with somebody just being surprised about an event, but really what we're talking about in shock is the failure of the cardiovascular system. For some reason it's shut down. And that can happen for a lot of different reasons. And since blood is not being circulated, tissue doesn't get enough oxygen, you get what's called hypoperfusion, low perfusion, not, you don't have adequate circulation, and tissue can die in most cases of shock, not all. And we'll talk about the difference between them in just a second. So there's a variety of causes from heart attacks to allergic reactions, and we'll cover each one of those. So we've mentioned this in several different slides, and you'll hear it repeated, because I really want it to sink in that brain death can occur within four to six minutes without oxygen. So if you don't get oxygen to the brain, areas of the brain can die, and they won't repair themselves. Abdominal organs, you have a little bit more time, so 45 to 90 minutes depending on the organ, especially if they're cooled. That gives a little bit more time because the cells don't use as much oxygen and don't die off because their metabolism is slowed down. Skin and muscle, three to six hours. So you have a little bit more time for skin and muscle. But it's the brain that we're most concerned about, especially with shock, and the organs as well, but mainly the brain. It's gonna be the first to die off. So causes of shock, and we talked about the perfusion triangle before when we talked about the body systems. But if the heart fails, it's no longer pumping blood, the blood won't do you any good if it's not being pumped around because it can't get oxygenated and even the blood, the red blood cells that do have oxygen still with them can't get to the tissue to deliver the oxygen. If the blood vessels fail, which is what happens in a lot of cases of shock, either they get severed or they dilate, so you have vasodilation and blood pressure drops and so the blood can't be pumped around even if the heart's still working. Or if you lose too much blood, obviously you don't have blood with the oxygen in it to be pumped around. So those are some major causes for shock. So what are the types of shock? You have the ones that are cardiovascular in nature, which is cardiogenic, meaning that the heart fails. So you have a heart attack that would be a form of cardiogenic shock. It's no longer pumping the blood around. You have hypovolemic or also called hemorrhagic shock where you're losing blood externally or internally or both. So there's not enough blood in the vessels to be pumped around. Then you have septic shock where you have some sort of massive bacterial infection like MRSA that attacks the vessel walls, causes them to leak, leak fluid and so you lose blood content that way, but you have two things that can happen. Not only do you lose blood content, it can damage the vessel walls, the muscles in those vessels that cause them to dilate and constrict, and they just dilate. And now you don't have enough pressure to pump the blood around, you don't have enough blood to fill the vessel, and so you go into shock. Then you have neurogenic shock, which is damage to the spinal cord, often use the example of Christopher Reeves, which was the 80s Superman. He's riding a horse, got thrown off the horse, broke his neck around C1, C2. Not only did it shut down respiration, but he went into shock because his vessels expanded. He had widespread vasodilation, and he went into shock because the, there wasn't enough blood pressure to pump the blood around. The vessels were too large. They just relaxed. Then you have non-cardiovascular shock, that's a misnomer. I know some books classify anaphylactic as non-cardiovascular, but you can still have widespread vasodilation. But normally what kills people is respiratory. The uh, airways swell up, get inflamed, the person dies. But you can also die from widespread vasodilation. And then you have psychogenic. It's still cardiovascular in nature. I know it's non-cardiovascular. It's acute, short-term. Most cases people don't die. So if you've ever seen somebody on, on America's Funniest Videos get scared and they pass out, psychogenic shock. The little goats that get scared and pass out, that's psychogenic shock. It's short, it's acute, 
and in most cases doesn't kill the person unless they injure themselves in the fall. If you've ever watched a MMA fight and somebody gets hit really hard and they get knocked out, psychogenic shock, and those people come back around. The blood, what happens in a fight like that when they get hit on the jaw, all the vessels dilate and the blood pools in the lower extremities so not enough gets back to their brain so the person passes out because the body doesn't have to fight gravity if you're horizontal and it makes it easier for it to pump blood to the brain and they come back around as soon as they are on the mat for a little bit as long as their breathing doesn't get disrupted. So care for anaphylactic shock. You want to call 911 right away because the condition may worsen. You want to monitor their breathing if they stop breathing and they have no pulse, begin CPR. If you have an epi injector, an auto injector, use that as soon as possible. And if you don't have it, you can also give antihistamine. That may lessen the allergic reaction, but it won't stop it. It won't necessarily stop it from happening. It may slow it down. You still need to activate 911 as soon as possible because we want them to get to the hospital and get treated. This is video one, so make sure you look at your lecture notes and answer the question about the video. So bleeding. Adults have five to six quarts or 10 to 12 pints. It's roughly about 24 cups, 20, 24 cups, somewhere right around in there, depending on the person. Obviously a larger person is going to have more blood, smaller person will have a little less, but on average five to six quarts. And I gave the example before of a V6 has about five to six quarts of oil in it. So if you've ever changed your oil, that's about how much the average person has in their, in their body. Adult, greater than one quart can lead to shock. That's as much, that you, you could lose that much internally if you broke your femur. You could lose one quart internally. Or if it was an open wound, an open fracture externally. That could put you into shock child one pint. So one of those little plastic pint bottles. They're a little bit, they're normally 1.1 pint, but you get the idea. It gives you the visual. And then you have hypovolemic shock. That's just loss of blood externally or internally. Low blood volume is what we're talking about there. External bleeding. Hemorrhage. Large amounts of bleeding in a short period of time. So you have three main types. And this is also hypovolemic classified as hypovolemic. You have arterial, which is harder to control. Bright red, oxygenated blood. It's bright red because it's oxygenated. Spurts several feet from the wound because it has all that pressure. When the left ventricle contracts, pumps it out to the body, it has a lot of pressure behind it. So it can be hard to control because all that pressure, when it squirts out of the wound, can be hard for the clotting mechanisms to take place. Then you have venous bleeding, a little bit easier to control. It pours out of the wound, it's still life-threatening, depending on how large the vein is. Darker colored blood, but it doesn't spurt out. It doesn't have all that pressure behind it like arteries. So that would be an indication that a vein is bleeding if it's pouring out of the wound. And then in capillary, that's like skin in your knee. Taking the skin off, get a little capillary bleeding, easy to control, clotting is easy as long as you don't have any sort of disease like hemophilia or haven't drank a lot of alcohol. Anything that would aspirin, all of those make it tough for bleeding, to stop bleeding. Arterial bleeding, bright red, like I said before, spurt several feet from the wound, unlikely to clot because of all the pressure, really hard to control. Venous bleeding, flows, dark red, easy to control, easier, I should say, to control, not necessarily easy. Veins typically will collapse on themselves because of lack of pressure. And unless it's a deep vein, it uh, may collapse on itself, and that will help control the bleeding. Capillary, most common, oozes a Band-Aid should stop the bleeding. You may not even have to put pressure on the wound. So if a artery is completely severed, or a vessel is completely severed, it normally withdraws and contracts, which can actually help slow the bleeding. Now we wouldn't go in there and sever an artery to slow, help slow the bleeding, but if it's not completely severed, that can make it hard or harder to control because it doesn't, the ends don't constrict down 
because they're still attached and it can't retract back into the tissue, which also helps slow the bleeding. So it's a blood vessel spasming at the end when it's completely severed. Clotting, normal clotting function without pressure, without pressure, I'm, I'm stressing that for a reason, normally happens within 10 minutes. <clears throat> With pressure, you should get control of it within five. So you may have a test question. If it asks without pressure, 10 minutes. If it's with pressure, you should get control of it within five minutes, unless they've taken something that makes clotting tough or tougher to happen. So like aspirin inhibits clotting. And anticoagulants, I mean, that's what they do. Anemia, hemophilia, all of those are conditions like liver disease can cause it. Drinking too much alcohol can also make clotting tougher to happen. Care for external bleeding. First, you want to protect yourself. So after we've gotten consent, or even while we're getting consent, we can put our gloves on. It's the most common form of personal protective equipment is putting gloves on. That's something that you could have on your keychain. They make these little keychain car carriers that have breathing barriers and gloves in them. And then you want to expose the area so that you can get to it. So if it has cl clothing covering it, you may have to cut away the clothing. Make sure you use sterile gauze. Direct pressure for five minutes again. We have pressure so we should get control of it within five. If it was without pressure, Hopefully it would happen within 10, but with pressure, it should only take five minutes to get control of it. Then we put a pressure bandage, like an elastic roller bandage, to secure the dressing. Check for circulation, make sure we didn't cut off circulation, and then call 911. If it was severe bleeding, you need to call 911, because it could start again. It could, they could move a certain way, or the bandage doesn't restrict or control the bleeding enough and they can start bleeding again. So it'd be good to have 911 activated, especially if it's an artery. So direct pressure helps clotting. Consistent, firm pressure, five minutes. There are times where you don't wanna apply direct pressure. So like a skull fracture, we wouldn't wanna apply direct pressure to that because we could take those bone shards and push them into the brain so in those cases, like embedded objects, skull fractures, protruding bone, we want to make it like a donut bandage and put around the areas that aren't broken. That'll help slow the bleeding. It's not as good as direct pressure, but it will help clotting start. If it's an eye injury, you want to cover the other eye because the eyes track. So if you look one way, your eye goes with it. So if you secure that object so it can't move and they keep looking around, it's going to do further damage. So you want to cover the other eye up so that the eyes aren't moving and doing further damage. There's no evidence for pressure points or elevation. It's not going to hurt if you try them, but it shouldn't be your primary method to stop bleeding. There's no reason that you can't push on an artery to help slow the bleeding. But the first step should be direct pressure. So, signs of internal bleeding, bright red blood in the mouth, blood in the urine, pain or tenderness or swelling around the area. So broken ribs can cause internal bleeding. And if you see bruising in the abdomen, or it, the abdomen becomes really rigid, like a hematoma is developing, all indications of internal bleeding. Care for it, monitor the person's breathing. We can't go in and do surgery. So you can expect vomiting, so put them in the rescue position, if, especially if they're unconscious. Treat them for shock. So you may have to control their body temperature because blood is a thermal regulator. If they lose too much and they have a hard time controlling their body temperature. Do no further harm and don't give them anything to eat or drink. But there's nothing we can do for major internal bleeding other than to treat them for shock. We can't go in and do surgery. We're just not trained to, to do anything like that. Minor internal bleeding, rest, ice, compress, elevation. 
So if you get a bruise, that's minor internal bleeding. So rest the injured area, don't keep using it. I sit down, that helps reduce swelling, but it also reduces what's called secondary death. So if you slow the metabolism of the cells down by cooling them off, they use less oxygen, less of them die off, and so you have less damage to the tissue. But if it stays hot and inflamed, the cells use up a lot of oxygen, more of them die off because they become hypoxic and die, there's not enough oxygen, and so there's more damage if it stays hot and inflamed. So rest, ice, compression helps uh, move away fluid retention so you don't get a lot of edema and swelling in that area and then elevation so elevate the, the wound so you don't get a lot of especially like if it's an ankle injury we don't want a lot of swelling and blood to accumulate in that area we want to keep circulation up so elevate the injury so it doesn't have to fight gravity pressure bandage so when you're applying a pressure bandage, this is a skill we'll do in class, put your gloves on first, get permission, all that good stuff, but make sure you have gloves on before you touch them. Direct pressure, sterile gauze, additional gauze if that gets soaked, but you never take that initial dressing off. So once you apply gauze, if you have to apply more, you can take some layers off, but never take that initial layer off. It's like ripping off of a scab. <clears throat> You just start from the beginning. You can make the condition worse. So add elastic, elastic roller bandage once you get control of the bleeding and then check for circulation. Make sure that applying the dressing didn't cut off circulation and then call 911. If you can't get control of it, you can apply a tourniquet. That's a last ditch effort. It means we can't get control of the bleeding with the pressure bandage, then we can move to a tourniquet. And I'll show you in a video how to apply a tourniquet. You go about two or three inches above the injured area. So you're going to be able to use tourniquets on limbs, like arms and legs. Obviously, you can't put a tourniquet around somebody's neck to stop their uh, bleeding. If they have a head wound, kill them, cut off their air supply, and supply blood to the brain. But limbs legs, arms, you can use a tourniquet. Let's talk about the different stages of shock. So you have compensated, meaning the body can compensate for the loss of blood. Then you have decompensated. The body cannot compensate. And we run the risk of damaging the internal organs if we don't get some blood back in us, if we don't seek medical care. We've lost too much. The body can't compensate, can't produce enough doesn't have time to compensate for it. And that can lead to internal damage of organs. And then you have terminal, irreversible. It's also called irreversible shock. The damage has been done, the person's going to die. So this is video two. It explains everything I just talked about, about shock. It's a really good short explanation. Watch that. Answer the question on your lecture notes. General care. So monitor their breathing. If they're not breathing, call 911, begin CPR. Control any external bleeding. Place them on their back or half sitting position if they're conscious and having respiratory problems. You can pat their head, but make sure you don't have their feet too high up off the ground. So you can prop the feet up. Some books discourage you from doing that. But you don't want to do that in a bed because it can cut off their airway and make it really tough for them to breathe. And keep them warm. They're going to have trouble controlling their body temperature because they've lost the blood. Blood's a thermal regulator. Seek immediate medical care. This is treating for shock. So that's the general care for shock. If they're unconscious, unresponsive, the and you're worried about breathing, place them in the rescue position. You can still control bleeding and you can still control their body temperature from there.